Right, good after, afternoon, everybody. Thanks for um, joining us. Uh, Fergal Coleman is my name, and this is my colleague, uh, Philip. We, we run a business called Symphony 3, uh, and today we're going to talk about um, digital local government. So probably about 50% we're a small um, digital strategic con consulting company, really, based in Melbourne. We've also got offices in Mumbai, we're about 10 of us. Um, Probably about 50% of our business is dealing with local government clients. So, over the last 30 years, Philip Ward and I, but we've worked with probably 60 odd local governments uh, around Australia. Um, and I guess what we want to share with you today is our thoughts on digital government. It's, a, it's an issue that's been consuming us, I guess, in our business as consultants. Um, we think Drupal fits in. Um, we've spent a lot of time thinking about it and we're going to give you our perspectives on what we think works and what needs to be done in, in, in local government. So, um, by all means, ask questions as we go. I'm very much on the um, non-technical side, so I've heard the, the term glue human uh, used in a couple of earlier uh, sessions. I am probably that glue human. I stop things in the tracks in our company by saying we can do things. Technical guys have to go and do it. So, but seriously, I was probably sit very much on the people side of the business, um, business background, business training primarily, and digital business. So I've been involved in the web industry for 15 years, I guess, 20 years. Philip comes from a, a data perspective. Uh, quite different characters. Uh, I draw circles and he draws boxes. And that really encapsulates a lot of the tensions, actually, that we think are going to go on in we actually think that at any point in time half the room is looking at the roof and the other half is listening to one of us and when we swap speaking they stop looking at the roof and swap over. We actually think that's how it works. Yeah. So look, we're going to waffle, we've got plenty of slides, too much information in there, we jump through what we think is not relevant to you guys and, and we'll see how it goes. But we put more in so you can go back and read it if you want because it's also hard, we've got some people here who understand local government and they're wondering what to do and we've got people who have never had exposure to local government wondering what is this thing, and we try to explain both sides of it. That's quite hard. We have a go. <laughs> Who is from local government? Who is from local government here? Okay. Oh, great. I hope you probably disagree with what we're saying. <coughs> yeah, we try to take it from what we think is a local government perspective. But let's crack on. Any questions, happy to try and answer them as we go. We've got Sohal here, he's a bit more technical than, than I. So I'll just defer to you, Sohal, if you have any tricky, tricky questions. Just going to talk, talk about the changing digital landscape and the pressure that we think is on local government. You know, underfunded expectations that are, are on local government are huge, we, we believe, for what are small ish organisations but pretty complex organisations. Uh, we'll talk about the new technical environments of the likes of APIs, why we think, think Drupal's the solution of choice uh, and how it fits. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about information management. So we believe the actual problem we're trying to solve for local government is uh, the notion of a single customer view. I'm able to give it, I guess, a full experience to the customer when they log in. So they can log in on a website, uh, they can go to the front counter, they can go to the swimming pool, the library, and they're all in one system. At the moment they're not. And that's a really difficult problem to solve. As See the local government guys smiling. <laughs> and then we'll talk about people and change because as much about the technology, this is about culture change and shifting people. Our job is to get people to the top quadrant. I won't uh, go into it in too much detail, but we've got a lot of people out there adopting web technologies without too much uh, strategy in place. You've got others with great strategy who are slow to adopt the technology. Uh, we've shamelessly taken that from a Cap Gemini report, so we, but we think it's good. So our, our our aim is to get all our clients to to the digital leader space, whatever that means for their own particular industry. We think local government employees are like the rest of us; they're just seeing the internet uh, and they're interacting with the internet in almost everything they do. And you can go through all the stats there, but you know, people are using social media, people are using uh, the web, they're logging on to Amazon, it's telling them what they want to do, and they go into their own offices, 
and you know, they're often working, they don't have access to social media, they're working on old computers, they can't deliver the service that they want. This is obviously yeah, leading to uh, huge new di digital uh, models, business models. So obviously Amazon been a classic one. Any of the ladies in the room will know Shoes of Prey. They can, you know, totally new types of di business models that are just disrupting every industry. Oops. National Australia Bank, 94% of transactions conducted online. Everyone kind of takes that for granted, but that's happened in probably the space of 20 years. Why can't local government do the same? You still have to rock up to the counter at local government. Uh, so has just come back from India. You know, banking there is even a couple of steps ahead. So people can now, with a Twitter account, uh, do transactions with their bank. So this is a remarkable times and changes that we're, we're living through. Uh, it's the technology, but it, you know, the real disruptive scenarios come out of people understanding how to use those technologies to develop new business models. Local government is facing, I guess, already similar demand. And the community is just used to logging on and doing things seamlessly online in the private sector. And then they go to their local government website and they get no experience whatsoever, generally speaking. And there are some exceptions. I've listened to obviously the Gov CMS guys. You know, there's a huge amount of uh, things happening, I guess, in overseas. Estonia being a classic example. We had the example of the White House uh, and, and the UK. So we're observing this uh, in the local government space. Um, the Australian government's obviously starting to take heed, and we're starting to see it at federal level. So, you know, you've got your Digital Transformation Office that was announced um, last month obviously got the, um, the likes of MyGov for driving people online. Um, Aquia we've heard, heard, heard from today. So this has been talked about pretty um, strongly, I guess, in, in local government. They're aware of these things that are happening and, and also at, uh, at state level. And I think people think, um, I think the other thing that's happening is this underlying technical change. So I'll let you talk to the, some of those, uh, Philip. I'll go through this in detail a bit, a bit more later, but <coughs> software is moving to APIs very strongly, the whole Uber, anyone who was next door in the previous speech, Spotify, all those sorts of things are just collections of bits of services that are put together and then they're rebundled and put out as services again. The old um, SOA ESB, excuse me, I don't know what, the, what they mean, but um, the older web services technologies are coming of age, the Internet of Things, your um, fridge can now get hacked, basically. Um, and large corporations are tackling this. They're moving to this environment uh, quite quickly, from my observations. And that's changing IT departments within organisations quite rapidly. In turn, that's going to affect local government IT departments. And Drupal, if you're going to go into a local government with Drupal, it's got to live in this new world, basically. And, and, and it can, but can, how do you do that? How do you fit that into what a local government is? It is the challenge we're trying to deal with. Um, I think the other thing, you know, uh, local government is different. So I saw uh, the Gov CMS guys at previous talk were talking about here, I think they're, they're th pattern three of, of websites. To my mind, a lot of local governments will feel they, they sit in sit in that uh, tier three. They're small organisations, but they're pretty complex. They, they deliver over uh, 100 services. Would that be right? I don't know what what council are you with? What, which council are you with? Uh, we're in your council. Okay. Yeah. So you know, if you were in the private sector, the, half of those would be divested. You just wouldn't do it. A water board delivers two. Most state government departments don't deliver more than one or two services. The local government is one of the most complex organisations that we've seen in our consulting careers. A car maker makes one. Um, yeah. This makes this problem really tricky to solve. They've got to solve it on less money, generally speaking. But they don't have the IT budgets available to them, which obviously makes Drupal somewhat appealing. Um, I think they've been really poorly serviced by existing, the, the existing web industry. So some of the CMS providers, certainly in Victoria, 
are doing a disservice to, to, to this industry to a, certain, to a certain degree. So, you know, we go into communications departments and IT departments and they're really wary and really skeptical. It's just another CMS and I think we have to be really, really careful about that. Um, the other thing we observe is local government, uh, the digital initiatives at the moment tend to be run by the communications department. Not, a, not in every case, but in a large number of cases. They understand outbound communications and they're very often um, under huge pre pressure to deal with crises. So they're always running to the mayor. They're not necessarily, they don't get the time to be that strategic about, about these communications. And I think that's a big uh, consideration certainly for us. Conversely, we actually get the customer service people who don't believe the website's got anything to do with them. Um, and we'll argue the point as well, um, quite strongly in some local governments, which I think is quite interesting by itself. I mean, the whole concept of it's inbound, well, maybe it should be ours, never mind where it comes from, is an argument we have trouble winning at times. Um, and then there's the councillor factor. So, you know, not every decision is rational, I guess, in some cases. Doesn't look like a backhoe. Yeah. <laughs> so we deal with some regional councils. Uh, this, this stuff's just totally foreign to the councillors. And then, of course, they're um, the same as everyone else. Yeah, yeah. They're just too busy to make changes. So. so this is the context in which you know we're all operating, I guess, to a certain degree. Um, at the same time, um, uh, I guess when I started doing work in local government about four, probably six years ago now. Uh, I've done a lot of digital stuff in the private sector. I kind of fell into local government doing social media rollouts. Everything from setting up simple web um, Facebook pages and Twitter accounts. But that was really quite empowering for many people in local government when they got access to these tools, bring your own device, and they were able to actually go out and solve problems just by simple communication. Um, and Philip and I probably, Philip coming from the data background was saying, well, that's all well and good, but this uh, social media stuff is, is creating all this data. You know, they already can't handle the data they've got in their systems. How are we going to get it into, into uh, the corporate system? So we spent, we spent probably a good six months trying to figure out how to get social media data into a CRM using tools like this, uh, an example of using uh, Ushahidi as a tool to filter data into, into the CRM. Um, and then we realised that uh, we'd only kind of dealt with two of the three areas. And that well, the other more interesting <laughs> thing that happened there was um, it was actually a very powerful tool. What the building didn't understand it. They sort of said, well, hang on, why would you want to catch social media? We're just going to force people to our app. Um, they're going to use our app. Why would they use another app? And it just didn't get that they couldn't actually just extend the corporate system with an app, and that's all the public's ever going to use. We struggle to make the paradigm shift. But also, in fact, some of the processes are just so antiquated. So if you think about you know, the, the now that we've got there and awareness, is, is we use this all the time at our council, council that we work with. Um, yeah. That's what the banking sector was like probably 20 years ago to a certain degree, before it went to 94%. So in some respects, most councils are still operating so much manual uh, input, uh, it's such a pain in the ass for the citizen or the resident to deal with council. So we kind of had a bit of a think and we went back and we thought, look, websites, just web, basic websites are wrong. There's not, and, and we, we kind of evolved this notion of digital platforms and that we needed to start talking about digital platforms as opposed to, to websites. So what we think the community look at, um, you know, use these personas. Uh, council tends to be property centric, not customer centric. Departments are set up to deal with issues that just aren't properties. Properties go into the CRM. So we spend a lot of time talking about personas and the development of personas. This is what council thinks, uh, you know, or, or I guess this is what the community wants to see. They think, well, I'm going to deal with council. Well, that's what they think is actually happening. When you have a look under the covers, that's what's really happening. That one day they ring up and they get put straight into a corporate system, the next day they go and log in on a website, the third day they go and communicate through social media. Completely parallel processes, people in local government can't tell that
that that same person has done those three actions, I would say in 95% of local governments to this day. Which makes our little characters pretty angry. <laughs> I might add, we've, um, there's some really interesting social media chatter about people getting frustrated in this whole area. And we've had a tendency from council laws to dismiss them as crackers. What's actually happening is Mr. Smith is in, you, you reckon, up to 25 well, different systems? Well, I'll qualify that. Local government keep name and address about 25 times. Some of them get it down to 8 or 10, maybe, or less. Very rarely do they really get down to one or single customer view. So you can Very go, rarely. You can pay your rates, you can go to the library, you can go to the leisure centre, you can get meals on wheels, keep going. And, and it gets down to the, possibly the property centric if you're a tenant. They don't seem to need to keep you in the corporate systems in most cases. It might be in the library system, but no need to be in the rating system because you don't pay rates. So which one's the central register? Uh, and that goes back to, uh, there's a culture, I guess, of servicing properties, not people, in traditional local governments and traditional local government systems. And that goes right back to, if you have a look under the covers of all of the systems, the database schemas are actually wired backwards for a customer-centric view. So it's a real challenge. And then people like me go in and give them social media, and they start using social media, and a whole lot more data starts flying around the place. But there's no way of tying it up, you know. There's no sales force where they can say, this is the person's Twitter account. They've rung up to, to complain. I can see they've also been on Twitter to complain about this. I can see that they're pretty loyal to the library, they're pretty loyal to the, the, the leisure centre, so we should really go ahead and solve this problem. Or this person's an absolute crackpot, doesn't really matter what we do, we're just going to keep complaining. You don't get that notion of a single customer view, and you can't build a relationship, and you can't deliver services. And the data, much as there's great people wanting to deliver better customer service, they don't have the system or the systems in place to let them do that, in most cases. And to a certain degree, if you just go and put the traditional Drupal in a local government, you're uncomplicating it. You're just adding another separate system. So we end up with three silos in council, I suppose. When you... Yep. So my the previous slide was mine with the little ladies and men. This, the boxes are, are, are Phillips. <laughs> so council talk? systems that, while they're mature and been around for a long time, and they're stable, and they certainly collect revenue and rates and all that sort of stuff, they're relatively self-contained within a vendor. Um, they manage properties, not residents. Um, very rarely do they not have duplicates in them in both names. A lot of councils don't actually have a clean list of addresses. Um, and of course, if a modern CRM just says, don't be silly, one person can't live in two houses, and then two families can't live in one house type thing, so they just refuse to load them when you go to put them, like a government data into a modern CRM. Um, and someone rings up and says, well, I've just moved. The poor old council staff don't quite know where to start putting that information in. They think they're putting it in the right spot, but when you track the data around the back end, it's actually going only into one spot or in the wrong spot or not updating all of the registers you think it is and all sorts of stuff going on. Um, you then go and have a look at the websites, um, duplicate functions in the websites that are the, the main main systems all also have. Uh, email management in a local government is... Uh, it's a classic example of, of communication. <laughs> you know, you, you, they're all it. using something simple like um, 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 MailChimp, but every single department has their own MailChimp, so I might be subscribed to board and I can't go to a single place. I'm unsubscribed or decide what I want to go. Very simple example with just no part of actually the customer and what the customer wants. And websites and intranets are duplicated functionality with their C internal CRM, with the GIS, their document management. Um, we had a local government where Fergal did a really good community consultation, really pretty Google Maps, red and green raindrops for who was for and against all the stuff. GIS department didn't even know that that project existed, and if they did, they couldn't have participated in it because they had the wrong technology. Um, culturally, just completely different planets in some respects. 
And social media is really BYO software, yet we've got IT departments saying, well, we control software. We supply your software. Um, the, the public are now expecting to use social media to communicate with the council. They expect responses back out through it. The council's actually got a legal obligation to store some of those communications under the Records Act. That's a challenge. Um, and the very bottom dot points one that we probably underplay in this presentation, but local government is part of the whole of government and is expected to live in the coordinated information world in the future. Um, live through APIs. Do you guys find that the size of the council, the population of the council, affects the quality or the amount of problems that they're facing? So the bigger they are, the less problems they have? Uh, I reckon it's, 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 <laughs> it's the reverse. Really? It's easier. I think, I think it's easier to get a mid-sized to small local government straightened out in this respect than a really big one. Mm. And we've, uh, probably not to give too much away, but we've been piloting, I guess, these thoughts with probably a dozen of our close government clients and we've chosen the small... The most advanced are the small ones. Right? Yeah, ones that we can round up and we can get to the CEO and we can, we can get everybody around the table. Is that because it's a small number of councils? We, we, <laughs> depends. Less internal yeah. politics, yeah. Yeah. I suspect. And look, every other organisation is the same, but uh, local governments are different to working from a consulting perspective. Um, and that's fine, you just have to understand what that environment is. So here's the, um, I guess what we think the solution is. <laughs> um, fundamentally you've got to coordinate your information you've got to technically coordinate your environments it's as simple as that you, you don't go out and buy another box that solves it all it quite simply can't because you don't have control over the whole environment um, and I suppose the point of this talk is that Drupal has to fit into that overall environment, it has to fit in with your social media, it has to fit in with your corporate systems, and the information management is simple things like, have you, do you produce the same address in every system? Um, and it's really easy in a local government to find an example of a block of flats having um, three of the 20 addresses different. Unit one, flat one, unit three, they don't match up. Um, those people aren't matched up because they're, they're they're treated as living in different houses, so therefore they must be different names. Um, so the end game is to actually have an overall framework so that people, when they communicate with council, no matter how they come in, it's a, it's a coordinated environment for them. We think that that's a basic framework of what the public expect to do through a Drupal environment. And I, and I won't go through them, but the ones that don't happen very often at the moment are um, fill out a form and make a payment. And by that I don't mean use a number that the council's already given you. I mean go in and put my name in for the first time and register for Meals on Wheels and pay for it and get an invoice without council having to pre-approve me. Um, at the moment, for a lot of the online payments in local governments, you have to know your property number, but if you're not a resident, that's very difficult. Um, we'll keep going there. Um, but the second thing, and this is a Drupal, or you want to talk to what this is? Yeah, uh, well, this is just a, um, we, my digital council, so this, I guess, is a, um, a test site, a beta site that we've built. Um, prototyping on there on, a, on an ongoing basis. Well, well, more to the point, we actually use it to run workshops in a local government to challenge them about what a digital platform is. Um, because this is very much task driven. That's the core. Yeah. On the task driven stuff, and I listened to the earlier talk, you know, um, the Jerry McGovern, we, we kind of follow that philosophy, I, I guess, to a certain degree. We think Drupal is, I won't preach to the converted, we think Drupal is a great platform for it. I'm not going to, you guys know Drupal better than me, I'm still a relative newbie. Um, 
you know, if we look at Tim O'Reilly's, you know, key aspects of a, a successful platform, I think it ticks most of the boxes as, as a community, as, as, a, um, as a technology. What we think um, from a local government point of view, look, open source works. They're paying huge licensing fees a lot of, uh, for them, a lot of um, councils. Well, they can eliminate that and they can spend it on, uh, on decent consulting if they want or on other getting an internal person in some cases it might be uh, one full-time person to clean data as we have in, 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 one, in one council. The, the um, platform itself is probably cost positive for the local government but the information management is where they're actually lacking so overall it still costs but it's going to cost anyway. Yeah, well, it's look, the I commercial think, reality yeah. of it but the whole open source, open standards, um, open data are coming at local government and the whole of government of steam train, if not already here. Um, and Drupal is perfectly that uh, For example, in the UK, um, local governments don't have to tender if they use open source. It's, it's my understanding that things like that are coming here. Um, the, the business cases for open source are putting enormous pressure coming right down federal, state, local. <coughs> but it's not openly there. Yeah. The pressure's not openly in London government yet to move to open source platforms in this area. Certainly, yeah, certainly not in Victoria. No. Uh, reusable uh, modules, there's a module for that was used uh, in one of the earlier um, one of the earlier talks and certainly within our business we say we don't want to go out coding. There is a module for that, we need to choose the right ones obviously. But our job is actually to apply the technology to the business needs. We think that's more important. I think that's where we think we can add more value to a certain degree. If there if there isn't a module, I, our approach would be to actually look for the closest one and pay someone to actually make it more suitable rather than reinvent the wheel. Um. Oops. No, I've done that. Front. Too much information. You get it yet? Um, Drupal as a CMS, we've talked about it versus a digital platform. I guess these are just some thoughts we, we jotted down. I think there is a danger that a lot of people will just go and put Drupal, and, and some councils already are running Drupal. Um, they just put it in, it's a new CMS. You can save in your licensing fees and we'll put a new CMS in there. That in itself is not necessarily banned, but it doesn't actually solve the underlying problem. Um, and parts of the way you structure things in there may have to be redone if um, if you then want to go and manage information and manage what's going on on your things like logins, you want to manage that against other logins, you've got enough corporate systems. You may have to then go and have a rethink about how you build the forms and that sort of stuff. Um, you know, sometimes improved content, sometimes not improved content. Uh, certainly sometimes the same processes. So We've been looking at a couple of really good new looking uh, new council sites. Um, but none of the forms are web form. They're all just old PDFs. Once you get under the bonnet, it doesn't really help anyone in the in the long run. It's not solving the problem for the customer. Uh, again, driven through the communications department, so they don't think of the customer service impl implications, or they just don't have time. Um, they think Drupal and the Drupal data schema. So. Uh, we have plenty of arguments in here because Philip's a, a, an information wonk that we, we get our data wrong. Um, and, uh, and the data that we create for events or what events, probably one, bookings, etc., on a Drupal platform won't feed into an internal system. Well, we had a conversation this week where we built four facilities for events and I wanted to know how we're going to get the next 300 in here automatically. Um, you have to be able to do that sort of stuff in the local government have three or four hundred facilities that they need bookings. So if you go and build Drupal pages, you've got to be able to do that sort of stuff straight up. Um, that's just a, a classic integration example, really. Um, and that source data, in a lot of cases, in their asset management system, so if they change the um, capacity in a room, that should go through the booking system on that. That's the sort of level of information management you've got to get to. Yep. These tend to be shorter projects. And we think they can be quite risky, I guess, for a Drupal success in the industry. So word spreads really fast in local government. Uh, if you're doing a good job, 
it spreads. If you're doing a bad job, it probably spe spreads even quicker. So I think, you know, as a community, if we're going to put Drupal into these environments, we need to be really mindful of it uh, and mindful of the reputation of the industry. Drupal as a platform, so we talked about data, pilots and prototyping, so we encourage plenty of that and we'll show you the framework we use in, in, in a while in terms of our prototyping framework. Uh, customer centric, so as I said, you know, there hasn't been a huge amount, of, every other industry seems to do it to death, it doesn't happen as much in the local government sector and we certainly spend a hell of a lot of time on personas and customer needs, I'm just constantly getting back to that. Uh, leads to task driven websites, data driven websites. Um, new processes uh, and driving culture change so that is a huge one and again I hope you'll talk about the method we use to do that uh, I think you know the fact is is that Drupal is only going to be one tool for building this new digital enterprise it's not going to be the fix-all in, in our mind and most you're going to have totally different configurations in pretty much every local government we've thought long and hard about can you do a lot of government distribution to Drupal we think it's pretty tough because um, if you look at the current systems they've got and there's probably about 25 combinations of various other things they can have in the building, that it's almost impossible to find two local governments who have got um, exactly the same configuration. They're not the same. The question is, when, and when you're talking information management, the question is how far into the Drupal configuration do those changes go? They certainly go into the Drupal configuration. You may have We have this argument all the time as well. <laughs> I, I wrote a thesis on, on implementing technology in local government some years ago. It must be a complete status problem. But, um, and if you, in theory, local governments all do exactly the same functions. Yep. So in theory, this all works perfectly. Yep. But if you line up five local governments and say, you're all going to use that, someone will say, no, I'm not going to use it purely because he does. And that's just human nature. Yep. And I get a nod from the local government guys here. That yeah. is human nature, so you have to cater for that. Okay. So what we can do is um, pick the commonality that's sufficient and then do the twisting or the branding, and it is actually twisting and branding yes. for each local government. Yes. So there's that aspect to it. But then there's the actual, how does their rating system, for example, store addresses? Now, if you've got a dress searching running live on Find Nearest functionality, or how does the GIS store maps, if you've got all that stuff running live in Drupal, that will be different configuration depending on the source system or document management. And that goes through the Drupal configuration files. Yes. So you might have a combination of modules, but the configuration files, it would be a game call to say that you could actually download Drupal with the modules and how they're wired together. Yes. I don't think you can do that. We're thinking long and hard about that one. <laughs> <laughs> it also depends on how people on Drupal get into the system as well. Yeah. I mean, for a lot of councils, Drupal has its own handy list of talking to the backend system to be how they look at it. I mean, hell, a lot of councils are using SharePoint at the moment to do their websites, as scary as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that's the thing. I suppose we've got an obligation to make sure there's a long term path there and you don't do some short, and I'll talk a little bit more about immigration and, and what, how the wheels fall off that in a second actually, because you've got to make sure you've got an environment that's durable over the next 10 or 20 years, and that sounds a long time, but in fact, that's how long these things are going to be around for in various forms. Um, driven by the general manager and the CEO, really important. You know, anytime we have the senior managers on board, we, we generally have a lot more success. In fact, talking about um, what we commonly see is a communications manager and an IT manager looking at each other saying, this isn't working and it must be your fault, but we don't actually know what to do about it. Um, and that's fair enough from where they come from. Um, some IT managers see a website as none of their business, in fact, um, in some organisations, and that's not just local government. Yeah. But in fact, there is a path forward. They're just not quite sure who steps where next. They don't have a roadmap, basically. 
and it's a two to five year project in, in our view. So it's a long term thing. As I said, we're prototyping, so yeah, some of our clients, we, uh, we're out building, I guess, these services or these tasks. Just on the GRS side, uh, the average local government, the test of a mapping or find nearest function for a local government is can your mother use it? And I'd say 95% of the <coughs> current local government GRS applications your mother couldn't use. Um, but that's the typical person who's um, actually got to find where the nearest um, infant welfare centre is. A lot of stuff on the website is actually not usable, and so I'm looking at who's drilled there. Other guys have absolutely drilled me on this one. Um, we, what we're flicking through there are actually drupal stuff that's out live. Um, yeah, so these are the modules that I go out and uh, wreck the guys' heads with, and we, we, we go and build them. Uh, in ser all seriousness, um, that's all well and good, but you're not going to get, the, unless you've got your information management right, which is what you're going to lead into. Um, Do you want to go back and just show those? Yeah. Well? So that's um, that's community consultation running in Drupal. Um, Subsite currently under construction. Uh, venues booking system. A microsite. Yeah. Um, bookings uh, facility. Which, most, uh, which is something that most uh, councils will want. Uh, events. And a find nearest. So again, been able to go in and put their address in and it'll throw back local for the latest facility, or nearest facilities, should I say. <clears throat> I think we've got childcare centers and libraries and parks and things like that in, in that particular example. Just mindful, I've got about 10 minutes, I think, five minutes. Um, something that's already talked about, but the, the digital platform these days, <coughs> customers expect to talk to you through it. They expect you to listen and respond back to it. That's Drupal's got to be able to do those sorts of things. Um, and the comment come back, information management, I, or we think is the key to this as much as Drupal wants sits on that environment. Um, uh, part of my background is the corporate sector and uh, Toyota to name one environment, uh, 14 databases, a couple of million records each, 200 dollars, 15 different IT systems and the problem was how to get a single customer to get. That was quite solvable in Toyota. It's actually the same as the local government issue we've just described but it's a lot harder to solve in local government and not necessarily because of the technology. The technology cost, yes, because you've historically, and Waterboard's the same, you've historically tended to use the Oracle stack for that sort of stuff because it has all the bits you need and you quite neatly solve it. But local governments are generally too small to afford a full Oracle suite. That's now changing um, and changing rapidly. Um, most local governments don't actually run effective data warehousing, for example, whereas most big corporates would. You're sounding like Fergal. Yeah, it is. Yeah, look, it, but then why didn't Russia build the best cars ever? because that was their approach. I actually, I went through this with GIS and mapping some years ago and I really tried to find a good example of that worldwide because I, was, I did not understand the same issue. I really didn't. To, to rephrase the question, is there anywhere in the world that local government is going to aggregate the data that gets to solve that That lasts, not that I can find. I haven't looked lately and I've looked and looked and looked and I think the Sydney guys would know that uh, the exercise that we went through in Sydney where there was about eight local governments tried precisely that, spent an absolute fortune and then it's now
Okay, let me give you a good example. I've Maybe. been trying to have this argument with him for, yeah. and I would lose every We're time. We're not going to get them the presentation. <laughs> the New Zealand government gave the local, every local government in the state free GIS software worth about 250000 Free. Within about five years, half of them had thrown that out and paid money for a different one. Okay. As an example. If you can pull it off well and good, I'm not going to try on and poke it out of my back pocket. <laughs> Yeah, let's get through this and then you can yeah. argue away. <laughs> let's talk about the integration because the reaction to local governments typically is, is to actually go system to system with APIs. And the blue ones are roughly the internal systems, the brown ones are roughly the um, social media, digital platform type activities. It's not quite. Yeah, basically. Well, all the rest of them are actually customer facing systems as well um, family daycare, library. <coughs> You can't do point-to-point -point integration in local governments. There are too many combinations, and if you pull a system out, um, there are too many others that fall over. That's only a few of the integrations you need in a local government. But that's what I see local governments start to do. Then we've got the vendors who sell the blue stuff saying that if you run with us, and I know I'm getting a chuckle out of this one, well then we solve this problem. I don't think that you do solve that problem for multiple reasons. And one of them is the way they manage the NAR and what they define as a single customer view and a NAR. Um, and that goes for, I can say, I think all of the major local government vendors that I see. You have to go through an integration platform as far as I can see, which is the way you solve something like Toyota or a big water board. You have to go through an integration platform and Drupal has to sit on an integration platform. That then switches into the other system. Drupal functions have to go in, and, I, and I've just been to talk about the web services in version 8. Um, that and a couple of other things in Drupal are just an integral part of solving this problem for local government. And that in turn goes up to how you build your web pages, your forms, all of that sort of stuff as well. I just want to talk quickly about what I see is the new API world, and to a certain degree I'm teaching the converted here. Um, but software, the reason I say this is the local government vendors have not yet moved, they're starting to move, but they've not yet moved the way I see the rest of the software industry starting to emerge. And I've just come out of the um, API Days conference in Sydney three or four weeks ago. I don't know if anyone was at that, but that was pretty interesting in terms of um, IT guys from Toyota and News Corp and those sorts of guys saying, here's how we now currently is how we're going to run our world in the future. Um, very much APIs and just pulling functionality from wherever you can find it is becoming the norm, as in Google Maps or PayPal. That then means your in information man or your information environment as a whole has got many different suppliers. You're not going to a single supplier and saying, I'm going to buy my IT system off you. The world's very clearly moving away from that. Um, those APIs implemented properly are very clearly matched to services and outcomes with your customer. Um, they do the direct mapping through. The, the, the News Corp CIO gave a really interesting talk at that previous conference on how they, the methodology they're applying for that. Um, and the whole concept of headless Drupal and Drupal and APIs being stacked, so all of a sudden Drupal's, which come up in the previous session, Drupal's now an engine, not a content management system. It's an API engine, and you link that together with another one to get an outcome. And I suspect local governments actually end up with both a headless Drupal at the back end and Drupal's content management system at the front end in the long term, which might be an interesting concept for you to think about. But I suspect that's where they end up in this, um, because it's really about functions and APIs and how you put them all together. Um, Services-oriented architecture and service buses have actually matured rapidly in the last few years. Um, to the extent where the, the multinationals are now starting to implement the, particularly the freemium, if not the open source service buses, middleware solutions, um, they've actually got user interfaces. You don't have to be a programmer to build a web service anymore in these products, which I think is good because even I can almost knock one together. Um, and Mercedes and BM, the new cars are actually going to have a service bus in them. So I hear 
people say, no, that's too complex for us to run, but they're actually becoming mainstream because the new cars are being built for, um, for continual internet connectivity. So the manufacturers reckon they'll know there's something wrong with your motor before you do when you're driving down the road. And I forget the figure, but I think a Toyota is actually in the future will put out about five gig an hour of data. They haven't figured out how to catch it yet. Uh, <laughs> so this sort of technology is just, the web services is just becoming everywhere. And to a certain degree, this is going to come to the rescue of local government because they can take advantage of all this all of a sudden. Um, just on time, so. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, and modern IT departments are actually moving. The News Corp guy was actually interesting. He said, um, we will move to providing the glue to hang it all together, which is the integration environment. That will be our core role. If there's a function we need, we should be able to find an API for it. We don't think we have to um, get it built, certainly. Um, and we're not sure that... Um, We'll even pay for a lot of them. And if you do, it's pay per click or pay per use. Um, and the local government IT department, I think, has got to provide a digital platform for the organisation to use. I think that is their role. It's not customer service, it's not um, communication, not comms. So Drupal will actually live in this new world. Drupal will probably live in this new world way better than almost any other content management system is our belief. Um, it's just a matter of getting your head around what that means and what you've got to do to actually make, give it some way to live. But as a Drupal community, it's about um, not just putting a CMS in and ignoring the rest of the issues. Yeah, well, just on time, so we might um, we'll just rush through these pretty quickly. But uh, obviously, the people and culture thing is important. Not going to have time to, to get into it. Um, yeah, I think the Mc some of the McKinsey reports sum it up quite well. Um, I guess how we do it um, in a lot of our clients is we run we run eight week working cycles where we prototype, and we do that with, with digital um, everything from websites through to Facebook groups. And it's all about getting hands on and building prototypes and, and, and letting people make mistakes in, in a reasonably safe environment. The other thing it does is it brings people together from across the organisation. Um, and at the end of eight weeks, what they've created is either adopted or thrown out. Interestingly, Toyota described the same process a few weeks ago. <clears throat> and it drives change. And it changes behaviour. And we find that look, with, in, in government, this can really energise an organisation as much as anything else. They haven't, they're not uh, exposed to working groups like this where they're seeing what other parts of the organisation is doing. And they're actually been told to go out and try and solve problems with new technologies. So eight-week cycles is not our methodology. I guess it's pretty common, but it, we find it works pretty effectively if you get it running right. Uh, I will put a proviso on that, you've got to have the senior management at the top. You, you can get your CEO to, to have a vision and that just makes all the difference in the world because they can drive it forward. I might just leave it on that. I know we're, I think we're over time. But, um, but uh, happy to take any questions for a couple of minutes or um, we'll see people over a coffee, I guess.